I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 as Paul closes out his letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, looking at verses 13 and 14, this being Reformation Sunday. I want to preach this morning on a topic that really is a takeoff from uh, what Martin Luther said in that great historic moment. That we must take our stand. Saying that, I want you to stand with me and hope you found that passage in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, I want to get one to you. We have the text on the screen, though, because everybody needs to gaze upon the Word of God. It is the Word of God that is mighty, that is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is the Word of God that pierces to the deepest parts of our being. And so we make the Word of God primary here uh, as our Reformation heritage taught us to do. Verse 13, as Paul's giving concluding exhortations, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. We've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We want the Lord to teach us today because we need to stand. There are forces at work that are telling us to sit down and shut up. We need to stand uh, as this passage teaches us and exhorts us to do. Thank you. Please be seated as we look at this passage. I told you a while ago tomorrow, October 31st, will mark the 499th anniversary when Martin Luther, the Augustinian monk who was frustrated with what he saw in the religious establishment of his day, being the, the Western Roman Catholic Church, drafted 95 points of contention. Uh, the document he entitled, Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences. We know it today as the 95 Theses. Now, historically you need to understand, Martin Luther was not doing anything out of the norm. He had concerns. He had written them down on paper. He nailed them to the door at the church at Wittenberg, Germany, not as a, as a statement of rebellion or protest. He nailed them there because that's where you put notices. It was, it was the bulletin board of the day. He wanted to gather some people together and to discuss what he saw, uh, he thought, were abuses in the church. Now, he was an open-minded man. I think had people gathered with him and said, well, Martin, you're missing it here and here and here, I, I, he probably would have changed his thinking. What he did not anticipate was that his students would take this document, mass print it, and distribute it. And when it got a wider reading and viewing, it launched an unrest it spoke to hearts that were already troubled. And the result of it is what you and I call looking back as the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. October 31st, 1517. Luther was just shy of being 34 years old. November the 10th of, of that year, he would have turned 34. He was the unwitting change agent in the hands of God as one writer, I believe it was Spurgeon, said the gospel was sitting in the dungeon of papacy, singing sweetly, uh, like, like Paul and Silas in prison. Suddenly the door flung open and the gospel was set free to resurface. Now, I want to just briefly touch this morning on what it means to be historically reformed. We are Reformed here, or like I, I like to tell people, they say, "Well, you are reformed." Back. We are reforming, because one of the one of the battle cries that came out of the Reformation was the church reformed and always reforming. The day we stop examining ourselves, the day we stop examining our culture, is the day that we begin to uh, atrophy. And I happen to believe, by the way, that that's why we find ourselves where we find ourselves in this culture. I will say as long as the Lord gives me breath, 
while we have contentions with Washington, D.C. and other seats of power in this nation, the problem that we face today comes squarely back to it originated with the pulpit and the pew. If across the board, evangelicals embrace the idea of, be, of reforming and being reformed, these things would have been very difficult to happen. What does it mean to be historically reformed? Well, first of all, it means to affirm the great solas, uh, the Latin uh, language that was predominant among the, uh, the religious leaders of the day. And there are five solas. I won't preach on them today. I've preached on them before. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. The word sola means alone or only. That's why we say here, this is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. This is our guide. We don't, we don't consciously, intentionally do anything different from what this Word tells us to do. We don't adjust our views to today's norms because they'll be different tomorrow. But this is the unchanging Word of God. Sola Scriptura. Sola Gratia. Grace alone. Salvation is by grace alone, not grace plus works. Martin Luther's 95 Theses challenged the notion that, that you could do penance, good works, and change the heart of God. He knew that, that, was, that real repentance was the fruit of a work of the Spirit in our lives. By grace alone, sola fide, by, by, through faith alone. Not faith plus the sacraments, not faith plus anything. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, sola fide. Solus Christus, sometimes you'll see this solo Christo to capture the, the dative form of it. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Salvation is only in Christ. We do not try to make people happy by saying, well, if you found a different way to God, bless you. No. There is no other name under heaven whereby people must be saved and will be saved except in and through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you last week that makes us bigots today. Well then give me the, give me the badge. I'll wear it to the glory of God. And that's the last of the five solas. Soli Deo Gloria. To the glory of God alone. So get this picture. Scripture alone is our authority. Teaches us that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, and that is to the glory of God alone. Only He gets the glory for all of this, and all that we do, whether we eat or drink, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. So, so that that's begins to get at what it means to be historically uh, reformed. We need to affirm and promote a profoundly high view of the supremacy and sovereignty of God in all things. And see, God is actively involved in his creation, governing and overseeing all the affairs of men. We labor like we do because we believe he sits on the throne. We owe our allegiance to him. We want to hear him say, well done and faithful servant at the end of time. And by the way, whatever unfolds to us in the coming days and weeks, we will, we will submit to as the unfolding of the sovereign plan of God. God's sovereignty and supremacy. We must affirm our utter dependence because we are sinners. Our utter dependence upon God in all things, especially preeminently salvation. We must affirm the doctrines of grace, commonly referred to uh, as uh, the nickname Calvinism, which display God as the author of salvation from beginning to end. Uh, an acrostic. If we're going to be historically reformed, we've got to admit that people are by nature totally depraved, that God's choice of us is unconditional, that the death of Jesus Christ is effectual, that the grace of God that draws is, is irresistible, that that because of these things we have the hope of being kept that is preserved and persevering to the end. Take away any of this and perseverance is not guaranteed and yet in the scripture we teach that and we recognize that it teaches that and we embrace that. We must be creedal to be historically reformed. That means to affirm the great creeds of history. We've re recited them here in certain days. The Apostles Creed, the Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed. These were the great creeds of the faith that were laid down about the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ to protect from heresy that was arising in the early church. To not know these is to make ourselves poorer and susceptible to 
yesterday's errors, which simply dress them up, themselves up differently today. We must be confessional. That is, we affirm one or more of the great confessions of the historic Orthodox Church. We here affirm the Baptist Confession of Faith that was drafted in 1689. It is the fullest, um, most comprehensive expression of our faith. And yet it's brief enough, as Charles Spurgeon said, we have in this uh, a, a, a summary uh, of, of divinity, of modern divinity, of, of systematic theology. It also connects us to the other uh, historic Protestant uh, faith groups, uh, our Lutheran friends, our Presbyterian friends, our Anglican friends, our Congregationalist friends, those who embraced uh, confessions written about that time to say we are one on this, and that is our confession here. It's why we wrote it in to our Constitution and Bylaws and Covenant Confession when we adopted those a few years ago. Because it tells who we have been historically. It connects us to the past. It gives us understanding for the present and a path to walk for the future. We must be covenantal. That is, we recognize that God has only dealt in relationship with people throughout history, as long as there have been people, through covenants. And we've, I'm not going to rehearse that today. I preached through a series years ago on God's dealings through covenants. We're covenantal. We recognize that, that we today are saved because we are recipients of the covenant of grace. Uh, that we, are, we were in the mind of God when, when the Trinity struck that covenant of redemption in eternity past. And that the new covenant that we live under is a covenant that changes hearts. It's not just etched on tables of stone. It's etched in our hearts. We are changed people. And so we embrace that. We have a high view of Scripture, as I've already said, because it is our authority. Not, not as was said historically, well, Scripture and the traditions of the church. No, Scripture. Martin Luther was called to the Diet of Worms by the Pope's people. Called upon to recant of his writings. They asked him, at the, and he was, he was terrified, by the way. If you read the history of it, he, he didn't stride into there. All right, let's see what you can know. He was terrified. And they said, are these your writings? He said, well, I haven't had a chance to look at all of them. Let me look at some of them. Well, they postponed it and sent him back to his room. He went through and looked at them. He said, we want you to repudiate these. And they came back the next day and they said, do you recant of what you've written? Well, he was writing on justification by faith. He was writing on the, as the thesis suggested, the the unbiblical nature of indulgences. Children, you need to know indulgences were things sold by the church to grant forgiveness. And the money received was used, being used to build St. Peter's Basilica, this massive uh, monument to the papacy. And the story was told about a fellow who, who was a, he robbed a stagecoach. At gunpoint, he had his, he was on his horse and stopped the stage and robbed the people that were on the stage, robbed the possessions he could get. And, and the rider, the, the driver of the stage coach said, you're going to burn in hell for this. And his response was, oh no, I have my indulgence. He'd already been, he'd already paid to be forgiven of this. And that was the mindset of the day. And so there was a little, a little a jingle that was developed by a fellow named Tetzel who was promoting indulgences. As soon as the coin in the coffer clings, the soul up from purgatory springs. Okay? That's how they were selling them. You get your loved one out of purgatory if you paid for indulgence. Luther was opposed to that. So they asked him, do you recant? And he basically said, I cannot. To go against scripture and conscience is not wise. He said, furthermore, the Pope's men have written things that contradict one another. I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. That is our Reformation heritage. We must have a clear understanding of the of the relationship with the law and the gospel. I've preached a series on that in, in times past. I won't rehash that today. But the law has the, its three uses. It's civil use. The law is a restraining tool to wickedness. Folks, the reason we have the violence in our nation today is that the moral law of God has been abandoned from, from the arena of jurisprudence. 
An English jurist uh, wrote his commentaries on the law, and they were used in our law schools until the turn of the century. And he said in them, I've got it, I've got it said in my library, no law should be considered a real law, a legitimate law, if it does not line up with or if it violates one of the Ten Commandments. That was how people used to think in this nation. So there's this civil use of the law that restrains violence. I hear people say every now and then, well, capital punishment doesn't, doesn't stop violence. It stops the violence of the person who's executed in capital punishment. And if it's done close enough to the commitment of the crime, it sends a shock wave. Others hear and fear. But when a person sits on death row 15, 20, 25 years convicted of capital murder, then it, the whole effect is blunted if and when that person is ever executed. The civil use of the law. There's also what's called the pedagogical or the evangelistic use of the law, that the law is preached, and we talked, to press the sinner and, and bring the sinner to the realization that he or she is undone and a sinner before a holy God. And the sin is used to, as one writer said, to plow up the heart and make it a fertile place for the seed of the gospel to take root. And then there is the, uh, the moral or normative or sanctifying use of the law, that so after we're saved, we know that which pleases God. We honor father and mother because the scripture teaches us to do that. It's a way that we put a check on our sin. We don't commit adultery. We don't steal. We don't lie. We don't covet. We honor the Lord's day. All those are in the Ten Commandments. So, so we have to have a right. That's what it means to be historically reformed. Well, to the text. We need... A recovery in our day. When I say here we must stand. A recovery of what I call gospel courage. I wrote an article in this past week's uh, Owasso Reporter speaking to this. Gospel courage. We need a renewal of that today. It's going to take courage to stand in the face of what is coming, what is already here in this culture, and what is coming. Gospel courage I define as that unconditional commitment to live and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with compassion regardless of the consequences and no matter the cost. Our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are doing this. We must learn increasingly to do this. So I want you to see just real briefly this morning five things from this text. And they, fold, they just fall out. It's not anything clever. First, we must stand as watchmen. Second, we must stand firm in the faith. Third, we must act like men. And the idea there is we must act with maturity. Fourth, we must be strong. And fifth, we must do it all in love. And that's where you get this notion of, of gospel courage. It's all got to be done. Compassion. So we have these closing exhortations. It's almost like Paul is a general. He's, he's barking out these orders in rapid succession. Challenging the Corinthians. A very troubled church. All kinds of infighting and controversy and Immorality being de not being dealt with. He's challenging them to, to put these things into practice. They are all imperatives. They're, they're, they're commands. They're exhortations. Confident that some are already obeying this. But he does this, as Peter says, to remind you. This is not something new. I'm reminding you of what I've taught you before. So first of all, we must stand as watchmen. There's an image in, this, in the Old Testament. People primarily want to assign it to shepherds. But brothers and sisters... We are all called to be watchmen on the walls. Specifically, your, your under-shepherds are there. To sound the alarm. Again, why do we see the decay of our culture at such a rapid speed? I'll tell you why. Because in the pulpits of America, there's been an uncertain sound. you got preachers saying all sorts of different things. Let me tell you something. Political choices are not that complicated. We can get all tied up in personality if you want to. I, I'm, not, I'm not planning on voting for a pastor a week from Tuesday. I have pastor friends. You shouldn't vote for a pastor in chief either. You've got a pastor. But when you look at platforms and one promotes abortion on demand, partial birth abortion, the execution of a child, 
whose every body part is sticking out of the womb except the child's head and then the child is executed. And one platform promotes that and another wants to repeal Roe versus Wade. It's not difficult. And yet for pastors to, to bark from the pulpit as if those two things are the same or there's no difference to them is sinful. And you could, go, you could go on and on. That's just one example I want to give you. We've got to be watchmen on the walls and say that this nation is under the judgment of God because we have slaughtered millions of unborn babies in the womb. And God is handing us over. And it's got to stop. And we've got to stand as watchmen and make a, sa a clear sound. Say, this is ungodly. This is an ungodly position. Well, we have ungodly choices. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. In fact, I'll tell you, there's not a person on the ballot, unless you want to write somebody's name in, who's not flawed. The question for all of us is, what choice will I make that is most likely going to give us a place to stand to stop the holocaust that is abortion? And you go down the list of other things. Stand as watchmen. Be watchful, it says. This, this word occurs frequently in the New Testament. God's people should remain watchful and fully alert to thwart the approach of spiritual forces of darkness. I've told you before, the only way darkness can advance is for us to hide our lights. North Korean Christians are being slaughtered in unprecedented numbers. Well, isn't that stamping the gospel out in North Korea? No, just the opposite. Christians are being slaughtered in Middle East countries. Well, isn't that, isn't that stamping the gospel? Well, there are places where churches used to be that you won't find them now in the Middle East. But I've reported to you that there are more Christians coming, more people coming to faith in Christ in Iran than at any time in history. Persecution always, if, if we will shine our lights, persecution always causes the light to shine more brightly. Secondly, we must stand firm in the faith. So be watchful, stand firm in the faith. That's exactly what the text says. This idea of standing. And I want to just show you some passages, how, how this word stand is used in the New Testament. Just real quickly, go through them with me. You can get your Bibles out, you can look at them on the screen. But look at this in Romans 5, 1 and 2, where Paul is arguing for justification by faith, saying that through that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, that is Christ, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Brothers and sisters, salvation by grace through faith doesn't let any Christian sit. Religion will. Religion lets you sit and soak and take your ease. Salvation by grace through faith raises people up. This grace in which we stand. It's one of the uses. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, where Paul is writing in this letter we read earlier about the gospel. I, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Again, the gospel is something that calls men and women and boys and girls, when they receive it by grace through faith, to stand. Take a stand. Plant their feet. And say to the powers of darkness, this far and no farther. It goes on and says, by which you're being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, and then that warning, unless you believed in vain. You see, there's, there's a vain belief. There's an empty belief, a false belief. It causes us to sit and soak. It causes us to take our ease. It causes us to treat life like a, like a cruise rather than being on a military transport. We're in a war. We will be in a war. The war may have intensified. We've always been. We'll be in a war until we're convoyed safe to heaven. And then we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We'll be welcomed home. But until that time, we, until we become the church triumphant in heaven, we are the church militant on earth. And part of the reason our culture is in the, in the shape it's in is that Christians have been more concerned about being consumers than we have been Christ followers. Galatians 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, what are we going to do with our freedom? We're going to use it as a, as a cloak of licentiousness? We're going to use our freedom to do what we want to do? No. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I'm amazed at people, professing Christians, who have been brought out of 
out of darkness into marvelous light, who, who seem to cannot wait until they run back into the darkness. We've been set free from, from, the, from guilt and the power of sin. To do what? To stand firm for Jesus Christ. We're saved out of this, saved unto this. We're saved from this and saved for this. Philippians 4.1, same thing. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy, crown, stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. Why does, over and over, Colossians, same thing. Verse 12 of chapter 4, Epaphras, who is, who is one of you, servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature. What's he praying for them? He struggles in prayer. That you may stand mature. Fully assured. There's a connection, see. Some people struggle with assurance of salvation. Well, you, you won't have assurance of salvation if you neglect the means of grace and if you run the way of the world. But if you stand mature, full assurance of faith attends that. To live in sin and pursue sinful avenues and have assurance is really a presumption. In 2 Thessalonians, as he writes to the church of Thessalonica, chapter 2, verse 15, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions. He doesn't use the word tradition there like, like we do. That you were taught by us. In other words, those things that I taught you that, are, that you could depend on, that have a historical reference and have a future application. Either by our spoken word or by our letter. Stand firm and hold to the teaching. 1 Peter 5, Peter says the same thing. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. We read Ephesians 6. I won't even reread that to you. You see this notion of, of standing. Stand firm in the faith. The faith is not only your personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. The faith is a body of material. That whenever the latest cultural whim comes down the pike, we ask ourselves, does this line up with the faith? In other words, have we discovered something new? Because I thought historically that in the beginning God made them male and female. He made Adam and he made Eve. And a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. And marriage is God's idea. Anybody that tampers with marriage is not embracing the faith. We don't go soft on these kind of things. We don't need to be mean about it. Because that's the final thing I'm going to say here. But it's true. If it was true then, it's true now. Nothing has happened culture that changes these eternal truths. And then third, we must act like men. In other words, in the, and it's, this is not a male show this thing. The idea is, is men generically. Act like mature people. Paul said it to the church... In Corinthians earlier, 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, when I became mature, I put away childish things. I put them away. You know, at some point in life, it stops being about me, 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 me. I read passages like this and I, and I deal with people and I'm reminded of that scene out of Finding Nemo. Where the little fish surfaces and the and the gulls go crazy. What, what are they? Mine, 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 mine. You move beyond that. It's not about me. I read you the five solos a while ago. I saw. A, a, I won't go into the, the details of the background, but if you if you're familiar with the Babylon Bee, which is a satirical site. They came up the other day with an article about, about the newest solar, solar fields. Solar fields. Well, I just, that made me feel bad. I need a safe place. I, I just, that hurt my feelings. It just doesn't feel right. Solar fields. Completely antithetical to a principled stand in the faith and a mature stand act like men in fact one of the one of the better ways to render this is acquit yourselves like men acquit you know what acquittal means you go before a judge 
You've been charged. You're either going to be found guilty or you're going to be acquitted. Well, here's the thing. When life comes to you, when life presses upon you as if you're in a court, and the charge is that you're mature, I mean that you're immature, do you get acquitted of that because you're mature, or do you get found guilty? That's the picture here. Acquit yourselves. Like men. It's the only place in the New Testament where this, where this verb appears this way. My friend R.F. Gates used to tell me, Bill, you can tell a whole lot about where a person is in the battle for the Lord Jesus Christ by what it is that concerns them. Some of you have been in the military, you'll identify with this. What would you have thought of a, of a fellow soldier who was complaining about the way the uniform fit, complaining about the temperature in the tent, complaining about the comfort or lack thereof of the, of the, of the cart they were sleeping on, about the food? He said, you can tell a lot about where a person is in the battle by what the concerns are. No, people who are in the battle are concerned about, oh, are we being flanked? Do we have enough ammunition? Have we got good air cover? Where's the bombardment? Are we advancing on the enemy or is the enemy advancing on us? This term here. tells us that no soldier in the army of Jesus Christ has the time and should not have the opportunity nor the necessity of being faint-hearted. The story is told of Alexander the Great going into battle in one of, his, one of his wars. And they conquered the enemy on the field of battle that day, but there was found some deserters, and the deserters were brought back to Alexander. They brought a young man before me and said, young man, did you desert? Yes, sir, I was, I was fearful. What is your name? He said, my name's Alexander. He said, then young man, either change your attitude or change your name. He was offended that another fellow named Alexander would run from battle. And brothers and sisters in Christ, if we identify as followers of the Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, we need to change some attitudes about standing. Nobody's hunting us yet. I think they will be. That's why I'm trying to do my best as your pastor to get myself ready, get you ready, get my family ready, get my grandchildren ready. Because when the furnace blast comes, to this nation. And surely it must come because Christians in North Korea are being faithful unto death. Christians in Iran, in Iraq, are being faithful unto death. Just this weekend, Falani herdsmen, Muslim Falani herdsmen, slaughtered Christians in northern Nigeria. They're standing faithful unto death. We, as Josh mentioned, must develop and cultivate a mindset as a suffering Christian as a persecuted church. Not to shirk back from it, not to go hide, not to lose heart, but to stand like mature men and women. Fourth, we must be strong. This idea of being strong in order to do the things that we've mentioned, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be mature, there's got to be a strength. And that's why when we read to you Ephesians 6, 10 to 20 a while ago, verses 10 11, be strong in the Lord. I've told you before when we taught on Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul ransacks the New Testament dictionary, the Greek dictionary. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's looking for every term he can to talk about the need for strength. And by the way, the nature of this term here is passive. Pray that God will help you to be strong. Your strength doesn't come from within yourself. I will lift up my eyes into the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord. Joshua said to the people, Joshua 1, be strong and courageous. In other words, 
the Lord will give you what you need to cross over into the land of promise. You say, well, brother, I, brother, I feel weak. Good. Good. If you think you're weak, maybe you'll look outside yourself for strength. You think I can handle it? The scripture warns against that. Let he who thinks he stands erect take heed lest he fall. It's good to feel weak. It's good to feel helpless. We'll look unto the Lord who's promised to give us strength. Be strong. Be made strong is the, is the emphasis of the word here. God has promised to give us what we need in the day that we need it. Finally, we must do all in love. You see, I could take everything I've said right now, and then somebody said, well, I'll tell you what, that makes me so mad. That's not the point. The point's not to be made. The point's to be resolved. Let all that you do be done in love. Gospel courage is a commitment to compassionately stand for, declare, and live out the gospel no matter what it's going to cost us, no matter if it's inconvenient. I promise you, it's getting more and more inconvenient. I read the other day of a, of a young person who had applied to a college and on the application talked about her Christianity. She was turned down from college. Application rejected. Because she mentioned Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we're in different territory now. We've always been in enemy territory because this, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who live in this world, the inhabitants of the earth. We're going we're to look at that next Sunday as we study uh, for the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. He's blinded the eyes of the inhabitants of the, of the But here's the deal. We just kind of wanted to get along. Go along to get along. Peacefully coexist. You know what's happened? The world never liked us anyway. Jesus said when the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world, we just given the world reason to be more bold and hatred. So the culture officially finds Christians to be intolerable bigots. Well, we've got to love them. Share the gospel with them. Paul had said earlier in 1 Corinthians in chapter 14, verse 40, but let all things be done decently and in order. He's not, encouraged, he's not interested in us using weapons of the warfare of the world. We have weapons of warfare, he says in 1 Corinthians, or in Corinthians, that they're not carnal, but they are mighty. You remember what Joseph Sand said when he stood in this pulpit talking about being under Ceausescu's regime? They had arrested him another time. We're going to kill him. The officer pulled his gun out, his revolver out, to kill him on the spot. And Joseph Son said something that as long as I have a memory, it's burned into my conscience. He said, your greatest weapon is killing me. My greatest weapon is dying for Jesus. And they, he had a bunch of his sermon tapes piled. He said, when you kill me, my blood will be sprinkled all over these sermon tapes. And people all over this country are going to ask, what did this man live for and believe that made him willing to die? What's on these tapes? In love. In love. John Piper asked one time in a conference where I was there participating with him. He said, what will it take to see the Arab world one to Christ? The world of Muslims won to Christ. He said it will take the bodies of Christians stacked so high that that worldview that, that fancies itself a bunch of martyrs will look and go, what is it about this Jesus that they love so much that they're willing to lay it all down for him? We must stand on these things, brothers and sisters. Encourage one another and provoke, provoke one another to love and good works because you see, there's no shortage of indications that the cultural norms and presuppositions that we took for granted for decades 
are no longer given us in this society. It's our task to pray and work to see revival. A revival of the Christian faith, a revival of gospel courage in the meantime as we pray for revival. Pray that God will be pleased to raise up in us a culture of people holy, a holy people, a royal priesthood. Naming the name of Jesus gladly, courageously, because we live in a Psalm 2 culture that says we will not have this God to rule over us. kind of person will you be in times like this? We've just read what we're called to be. And we can rejoice that God's loved us enough that he showed us the path that we must walk in. We must love. They must be gripped with how much we love our Savior. They must be amazed at how much we love one another. And they must be overwhelmed at how much we love them, enough that we're willing to tell them something about their need of a Savior that may well evoke from them incredible ire. With implications we hadn't imagined before. We must do it all in love. Penn and Teller, the magicians slash entertainers, one of them asked the question. After he'd done one of his shows, a fellow walked up to him tremblingly and said, I want to give you something. He handed him a Gideon New Testament. And this, this fellow tells the story on, on YouTube. He said, I didn't. He, he clearly believed what was in it. I didn't so much believe what was in it. He said, I want you to read this. I want you to think about your need of Savior. He said, but you know what? I was impressed with his sincerity. And I thought, how many people do this? And then he said something that should shake us to our core. How much do you have to hate somebody in order to be unwilling to give them something that you're convinced would give them life. Here we must stand. And not just stand, but dig in. When the winds of cultural decay blow increasingly fierce, much like a Category 5 hurricane, we must stand and share the gospel. That there's a Savior who loves great sinners. I'm proof of that. And He will save you if you'll repent of your sin and trust in Him. And they may hate you for it and hate me for it. And the climate may come to prevail in this place. Or we will pay prices like being imprisoned. Ultimately martyred. What they must come away with is how we loved our Savior and how we love one another so we weren't ashamed to be identified with one another when the heat came and how we loved them for Jesus sake it's too easy to point fingers brothers and sisters point, point at this, point at that I think God calls us to point up look at the crucified Savior Look at his wounds. He pleads them now at the right hand of the Father. Look unto him and be saved, 
all the ends of the earth. For there is one true and living God. And Jehovah is His name. And Jesus is His Son. And there is no hope of having a standing before God apart from salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. It's got to be our message. Unmistakable. Crystal clear. May God give us the gospel courage to reflect His grace and His goodness Speak the gospel and live the gospel. Stop living for ourselves in such a time as this. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we confess it is perplexing. We think about what our founders of this nation desired. And we look at what it's become in the name of freedom. And we know that the definition of freedom has been lost on this culture, that licentiousness is substituted for freedom. And we look at the ignorance that abounds, and it, it breaks our hearts, troubles us. And yes, Lord, Lord we, we come back to, to the basics. That's, that's what I want to do today. I want to come back to the basics. I want to be a man who's found watchful, standing firm in the faith, conducting myself as a mature follower of Christ in strength that you have provided. And I want to be enabled by your spirit to do all of that in love, a, a true compassion for the lost. And I pray that for my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I pray for those here who are not yet followers of Christ. But these challenges, these exhortations would grip them, bring them under the sway of the gospel to be saved, and then strengthen them to stand. We ask these things of you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.